Good evening. Welcome to Politica Podcast. Tonight we have Brad Wilson with us. Uh, speaker, I, I still like <laughs> to call you that, but, uh, you, you know, uh, of course, you're running for the U.S. Senate. Uh, you were probably the first one that got in that race, weren't you? Yeah. Well, one of the first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Senator, uh, it's good to be with you. Thanks, John, for the invite. We've known each other uh, from before you got into politics. And, yeah. Uh, You've got a successful career, and uh, you've made an impact now at a state level, and now you're doing big time media. So yeah, well, I mean, it's great to be on your it, podcast. It's nice, it's nice to have you. I, I I appreciate you coming in, and and let's let's talk just to begin with. Let's talk a little bit about you. Yeah. Because one of the things I like to do is make sure that the public knows yeah. something about the candidates, and sometimes that gets lost in sure. the shuffle. So let's talk a yeah. little bit about you. Uh, you know. Early life, and then you know, of course, people yeah. people know you from being Speaker of the House, but For there's sure. a lot of other things. Yeah, well, there there is a lot to all of us, right? And uh, without getting into too much of the detail, I'm a Northern Utah, born and raised up here, born at McKady Hospital here in Ogden, and lived in Davis and Weber County my whole life. Uh, my family, uh, Jenny and I, live in Caseville now. We've raised three kids, and uh, one is married, and. Life is good that way. I spent uh, uh, my college here time was here at Weber State, so being in Ogden is like being home yeah. again. And my wife is from Ogden, so it's just, just she actually grew place. up in my neighborhood. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. we know you're friends with the family, so yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, I've loved loved everything about being here, starting a business here. Spent my career in finance as a financial planner, and then in running a small business, a small home building company for years. And so that's... I know we've, yeah. we've been through uh, plenty of your houses yeah. and the home show. And yeah, yeah. That good old days. That's yeah. right. But, uh, and you know, being a, a small business owner is not for the faint of heart, but such a great experience. You risk it all. It's, it's hard. You create a lot of jobs, though, and it's very rewarding. And uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot, and I think it was really instrumental in helping prepare me to be an effective lawmaker. I think so many lessons that I learned as a business owner, I used as Speaker of the House or as a, a member of the legislature, and I think that's one of the reasons why Utah is one of the best-run states in the country, is we don't have full-time politicians. We have a part-time legislature, and they have to go back and live with the consequences of their work. And uh, I wish the rest of the country was like that. And I sure wish D.C. was like that. We've got yeah. far too many career politicians back there. You, you kind of know how to balance a budget. I mean, we're required to in the state, right? Yeah. Well, you know what we're not required to do, though? I mean, we are required to balance a budget, but we're not required to do some things we've chosen to do. Like we're not required to do uh, taking revenue that's above trend and not spending it. We're not required to cut taxes every year. But these are things we do in Utah because they're the right things to do. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if Washington could do the right things? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I mean, the financial situation of our country is pretty dire, I think. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, think about it for a minute. If in your household budget, your biggest expense was interest on your credit card debt, that's basically what's happened at the federal government level. I mean, we're spending more on Social Security than interest, but Social Security is a return of money that people have paid into a system for years. Other than that, the biggest expense in the federal government budget is now interest on the national debt. Yeah, it's interesting. It's past the military budget. Now. Yeah, and but you know, if 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 anyone were to go into you know look at a family household budget and their biggest expense was interest, you'd say, yeah, it's kind of lights out for you. You know, like start over. Uh, we can't really do that as a country. Um, we're the strongest country in the world, and we're still the leader of the free world. We're just not acting like it. So, so, so you know, since you, you brought up the bu budget idea and, and spending, what what would Brad Wilson do yeah. in the U.S. Boy, Senate? man, I'd like to go back there and kick butt and take names is what <laughs> yeah. I'd like to do. There's some butt kicking that needs to happen back there. <laughs> You know, uh, that's not very sophisticated language for you, as Senator John, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. It, I mean, it really needs to happen. There's some real problems back there. And well, you actually said it earlier. I mean, I think we have seen that there's just not enough discipline in Washington for them to balance the budget unless the Constitution requires it. And so we need to amend the Constitution and we need to get a balanced budget amendment in place. And I'm dead serious when I say that. 
and so that's something that I would like to go back and work on. I know Senator Lee's working on that. I think the more people we send there that are committed to that, the more likely it is it will happen. But I can't look at my three kids that are basically all grown now in their 20s and uh, tell them I'm doing half a decent job if I go back there and don't address that issue because we're giving them that big problem. And, you know, I have toured um, as of last week, uh, I have toured all 29 counties since I started officially in my campaign in October. We, st we launched a year ago in April um, touring the state to see if I thought this was a good fit for me and a good fit for the state. But we launched officially in October and actually the end of September. So have you, have you now been to all 29 counties? Since October, I visited all 29 counties, um, done 150 plus events across the state. That doesn't even count a lot of the other things. So, so are attended. you finding across the state when you when you visit? Are you finding there's enthusiasm for uh, for what's going on right now, or people yeah. showing up? Yeah, boy, we've had some big events, and uh, there's a lot of different things I'm hearing. They want some change. Uh, they want to have someone that they feel like uh, understands Utah, understands Utah values, represent them in Washington D.C. Uh, they also tell me this, um, they, they say in one way, shape or form, and you'll appreciate this as a lawmaker here in Utah, but they say, Brad, when you get back to Washington, would you make it look more like Utah where, you know, things are run so well? And uh, so I think one of the things that we can export to D.C. is some of our expertise. And uh, I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to do that. I mean, as the only candidate that's running that's actually been in a position where I was the presiding officer of a legislative body where we had to balance the budget, cut taxes. And we passed what I think are some of the most conservative victories for Utah uh, in, a, in a generation while I was Speaker well, of the House. You know, and I, I, I know one, one, one thing that I was quite passionate about was this DEI thing. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I was just reading, uh, there was an article that just came out in the Atlantic and it basically said, Utah was able to solve this problem yeah, yeah. without being Florida. Yep. And, and I, know, I know you were involved early on, yep. uh, especially with these so-called loyalty oaths and yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with Katie Hall. So, uh, you know, what, what, what's your opinion of, about what happened with that and how that ended up? Yeah, well, I mean, on balance, if you look at everything we did, and here's what's interesting about this campaign, no one that's running for the U.S. Senate's actually done more around these DEI policies that I think are really bad uh, for our institutions, they're bad for our government, they're bad for society. No one's actually done as much as I have. I mean, you know, you go back to when we made it um, so that our education, our public education system couldn't teach CRT. Right. Um, and that was something I was and involved quite in. passionate yeah. about. And, and then we eliminated um, the ability for the state to use DEI and hiring initiatives. And then the work that was just done, which started when I was speaker around right. getting it out of our higher education institutions. Um, and all of these add up to just creating an opportunity for everyone that's equal. We're just saying everyone gets the same shot. Uh, that's all we want. That, that was, yeah, and that was that was kind of the point of that uh, Atlantic article. They were they were pretty, they they were laudatory, and this was coming from someone that wasn't yeah. a MAGA conservative, so called, right? Yeah, yeah. That not that if they they're just, writing for the Atlantic. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they they kind of felt like Utah Utah understood the nuance, yep. and they they understood that this we 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 didn't want to go in and tell yeah. universities what to do, right? And so that that was kind of an interesting thing. We just said, "Look, you got to be fair to everybody, right?" Yeah, that's right. Which is the right thing. And and well, we're going to take a break. We're we're okay, great. Uh, and then we'll be right back. Awesome. Hey Siri, how do I get to the state capitol? John, the fastest way to get to the Capitol is to make a lot of empty promises, to get help from special interest groups and endorsements from politicians. You will also need to buy a better suit. That's not going to work for me, Siri. You need to find another way. John, listen to me. If you're going to win your race, you will need to play the political game. You also need to use more hairspray and buy a golden retriever. Also, a new phone case would be nice. That's enough of this. John, John. John, are you there? 
Did you just leave me on the road? Fine. Keep your principles, John. My name's John Johnson. I'm not running to be part of a system, and I don't owe anyone special favors. I'm running to listen to and work for you. I'm running to get results. Welcome back to Politicket. We're talking to Brad Wilson, uh, candidate for the U.S. Senate. Uh, yep. So, so during the break, we 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 keyed we kind of keyed on a discussion about the uh, the Biden administration and these yep. new mandates. And, yeah. You know, you've had some experience in Utah <laughs> with respect to energy, and and uh, you know, you know, started down this path of Utah really yeah. pushing back yeah. hard. Well, you know what's interesting? I talked earlier about visiting all 29 counties, and there are certain things that come up almost everywhere. And it did not matter whether I was in rural Utah or up here along the Wasatch Front. People are angry. And they're angry that our elected officials in Washington, D.C. and Congress don't do their job. And they've created a power vacuum back in Washington, and that's all been absorbed by bureaucrats. And so now bureaucrats, instead of elected officials, are running the United States. And we all know it. And it's affecting our day-to-day -day lives. And these people with a stroke of the pen can disrupt small business. They can disrupt our own lives. And we saw another egregious example of it last week when Joe Biden comes out and says, again, without going through Congress, but with a stroke of his pen, says every car in this country that's going to be sold in the United States by 2032 has to be an electric car. Well, we didn't give him the power to legislate that way, John. He doesn't have the authority to do that. And I don't know if they're going to stand up to him and try to take that power back. But one thing that we did here in Utah that I thought was the right thing to do is when Biden, a couple of years ago, with another stroke of his pen through the EPA, comes in and says, Utah, you're not being a very good neighbor to Colorado. So we're going to make you shut down your coal-fired power plants a decade, a decade and a half earlier than you were planning. And we don't care. We don't care to all the, all the people in Utah if your power rates are going to go up and double. We don't care if your power is unreliable in the future. You just have to do this. So uh, two years ago, I still remember the conversation in my office at the state capitol. Stuart and Adams and I said, we've had enough. Let's sue the EPA. So we found some money. We sued the EPA so we could keep our coal-fired power plants open and stick with the plan that we had in our energy resource plan for Utah instead of them, some plan that, that someone in the EPA decided they wanted to put in place. Well, last August, we won that case. And you just saw this week Rocky Mountain Power announcing that they're sticking with a much longer trajectory, a much longer glide path to keep coal-fired power plants in Utah open. And by the way, our coal is much cleaner than China. It's much cleaner than India. Uh, we're, we're inflicting this wound. It's a self-inflicted wound on the American people for no reason. Um, but it's going to cost us all a lot more money. And it's not the way government should work. And I, I think the point of all of this is we've got to stand up and fight. We've got to stand up and fight this egregious power grab that's coming from bureaucrats in the executive branch in Washington. And it doesn't matter whether they're Democrats or Republicans. We can't let bureaucrats run this country. This is the United States of America. <laughs> well, I really, I, I really like the idea, you know, the, the, the idea of reliable and dispatchable power sure. that we've been talking about in the legislature. I, I, it, it's so important. I mean, you, you can't close that coal plant yeah. until we have something to... To replace it, yeah, right, yeah, that's right. And uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, we can't even pipe natural gas to those plants because yep. it goes across federal land, and we can't get the permits to do yeah, it. Yeah. It's even though it would help them accomplish some of the things they're trying to accomplish. I mean, we're our own worst enemy in terms of our government. And you know, it's funny. You're a lawmaker. I used to be. I hope to be again. But um, I always bristle when people would say to me, "You know, you're." you're part of government because I always felt like half of my time was spent fighting government when I was an elected official because that's what you do, right? I mean, right. you're trying to get it out of people's way and it's it's pretty remarkable how So so why 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 is Utah different from from your experience in the legislature? Yeah. Why why is Utah different in terms of 
of how we legislate? I think it's two things, maybe three. I think we have to give credit where credit is due. Utah is full of good people. Um, they have this very conservative values in general, and that's who the people elect. They elect people like them that like small government and low taxes, that we still believe in personal responsibility here. We don't believe government is the answer to everyone's problems. And so when the people believe that, their elected officials believe that. So most of the credit, if not all of it, really just goes to the people of Utah. But our constitution in this state is well written and it provides how the state legislature operates and that helps. And you know this, we are one of the last states in Utah to have a citizen legislature where people go serve for a short period of time and then go back and live with the work that they did and the consequences. Far too many states around the country now have full-time legislatures. And for sure this is the problem in DC with full-time lawmakers back there that are career politicians. So, so what are you, those 29 counties, Yep. So, so we talked a little bit about energy. We've, we've, what, the border had to have come up. Oh, yeah. Uh, spending the border, two issues everywhere I go. Bureaucracy everywhere I go. Energy almost everywhere I go. And the border, probably the first issue. And, uh, and I'll just cut to the chase. I'm not even gonna ask, I'm, gonna like, uh, I'm not going to let you ask the question. Uh, we need to build the wall. We need to use the military to secure our border. We have an invasion. It needs to stop. We need to give the Border Patrol the authority to execute their mission and do their job and the resources that they need and get the border closed. Then, at some point, let's work on the legal immigration system, get it fixed so that we can get the people here that we need for our economy to help our economy grow. We do want to grow as a country. It's in our best interest economically to have slow, sustainable growth, and immigration can be a healthy part of that. So what, what, what are some of the other issues that come up? Around the state? Yeah, you, you, you yeah, talked yeah. about them, yeah, but yeah, let, yeah. let's yeah. touch on them a little sure. bit. Sure. I can give you some of the headlines. I and mean, we talked about energy, okay. public lands, um, especially in uh, rural Utah, a big issue. And it's, I, I wish people on the Wasatch Front uh, could come with me to some of these rural counties and listen to the problems that are created by the federal government uh, with public lands. And the exact opposite of what we are told from Washington, D.C. about public lands is actually the truth. We're told that they care about protecting public lands, but yet when they create these national monuments, what they end up doing is hurting public lands because all of a sudden we have all these people coming. There's no services. There's no resources given to these national monuments. We actually see damage done to the public lands that didn't occur before the national monuments were created. Uh, you see also, um, you know, we just had a, a resource management plan released or options released for um, one of the national monuments. And none of the options are good um, in terms of how recreation can interface, how uh, grazing rights can interface, how mineral extraction can interface. Um, none of these are options are good for our economy. None of these options are good for energy independence. None of these options are good for recreation. And it, it's like people want to, want to, th these people in DC that have never been here are writing these rules and they have no idea the consequences of what uh, it's creating. And in some parts of our state, the anger is really high. So, well, you know what? We're, we're about out of time. Darn. And, and I know you've got other places to go, but yeah. why, why don't you make, uh, why don't you tell the voters why they need to vote for Brad Yeah, Wilson? yeah. Well, you know, of all the people in this race, and there's a slew of us, uh, there is only one that has been through the fire and has come out tested and trusted. And what I mean when I say that is it's not just delivering not one, not two, but three income tax cuts for the biggest income tax in the history of our state cuts. But... While I was speaker, we and one of my priorities was to get constitutional carry, which we de which we delivered. Uh, you know this. We we fought back and protected uh, against these racist DEI CRT programs. No one else in this race has done that. Uh, while I was speaker, we put in place what I believe are the most favorable pro life laws in the country, and we're defending those in the courts. We will win, but that's a reflection of our values. Uh, we fought the Biden administration and won. This list goes on and on 
But if people are looking for a proven conservative fighter that's going to go back to Washington and get results for them, there's no one in this race that can match my experience. And you know this, you've hired people for your companies, John. But when you're hiring people, you listen to what they say, but talk is cheap. We can't risk electing someone to the U.S. Senate that we don't know how they're really going to show up when they get there. And with me, you can see the strong record of conservative victories. I'm just going to let those continue to grow and grow when I'm back in Washington. Thank you very much. Brad Wilson, candidate for Senate. Thank you, Senator. Good to see you. <laughs> Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.